your spirit not only dwells, but is pleased to dwell. Lord, fill this place. Fill these hearts, Lord. Because we long for you, Jesus. You are welcome to come and dwell. Let my heart be a temple. sounds of heaven like the sound waters but it sounds just like water and yet it's full of words it's full of meaning it's full of heaven and heaven's message First, that our ears that can hear may hear. Sometimes we are tuned to other things, other problems, other burdens, other circumstances. Like Jesus said, having ears to be able to hear. We can't hear because of all the noises. All the noises that cover the sounds of water. So may the Lord drown out those sounds that are continually pushing for control of our attention. vying for control of our heart. And may we be still. Be still. Be still, my soul. Be still, my soul. Be still, my soul. Let the sounds that shout at us our urgent needs, our wants, our troubles, our pains, our questions. And we cannot control them. But He can silence just like he silenced the storm for the disciples. May the Lord say unto us, be still, be still, be still. Maybe like Martha, there's so many things revolving 
around us in activities present and future. Mary learned to drown out the calls of her sister. Can't you hear me calling you? But she wasn't paying attention. She was just paying attention to the sounds that came from the mouth of heaven, from Jesus. And yes, I'm sure Martha was calling. I'm sure she was banging and making noises, trying to attract her attention. So finally she burst in. Mary, you got to tend to this. But Jesus said, Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried about so many things. There's only one thing necessary. And Mary has chosen the best part. And inside of us, there is always a Mary and a Martha. A Mary that only wants to hear the sounds of heaven. The Martha that would like to, but she doesn't have time. That would like to hear the solutions, to have answers to her needs and those two parts within us vie for attention oh may the Marthas within be quieted be stilled oh they're still there she was still in the kitchen worrying about everything she was still there but Mary was lost to those sounds she was tuned to the sounds of heaven so we pray Holy Spirit that the sounds of the rushing waters of heaven from that river of life full of words of life full of hope full of health full of help full of answers full of healing everything our soul could ever long for is found in your river like the waters of baptize we were baptized in in which we first laid down our Martha our earthly attachments and rose up As Mary, as your child, your lover. So I pray, Holy Spirit, may the sounds of our Martha be silenced. And may we hear with all clarity the sounds of heaven the sounds of peace that say to our hearts peace be unto you and say it is well It is 
swear It is well With my soul What if Whatever is happening with Martha in the kitchen Mary will always say it is well it is well with us and Mary made an effort not only to listen to not go to the kitchen because she wasn't listening from the door of the kitchen she wasn't listening as she helped Martha and tried to listen to Jesus no, she was in the other room She was in the upper room with Jesus. Sometimes we're tempted to ease closer to what's happening. At the same time, listening at the doorway between the boat, between the two. But not Mary. It wasn't either or. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Later, yes, she would help Martha set the table. They'd eat together. And they'd do all the Martha things as they would visit in the house. But that moment was a moment when Jesus was speaking those are times we must learn to shut off everything else so help us Holy Spirit to hear the words of life when we come when we gather together and you are in our midst speak to us for we listen let nothing interrupt us even if Martha burns the food just let everything outside don't let anything interrupt until he stops speaking that is when And rise, go to the kitchen. Solve what needs to be solved. But never let the kitchen rule you. Let his speaking to your heart. Wherever it might be or whenever it might be. Stop. Listen. Until he's through speaking. Continue 
And I assure you, if you do that, all will be well. So, in just a few days, Friday, the 11th, is a holiday in many states this next Friday. Some even celebrate the 12th, but most the 11th. In some states it's not, and as I give you the reason why you will understand. Next Friday is called Lincoln Day because it's a celebration of the birth of Abraham Lincoln, the 12th of February of 1809. <clears throat> For those of you that might not know who he is, he is one of the most popular and beloved presidents that is quoted constantly, even by the government, by the people. And it's the most popular of all our presidents in our history here in the United States. And when people go to Washington, D.C. to visit, one of the most popular destinations is the Lincoln Memorial. And on the stones of the North Wall and the South Wall, there are etched the words of two speeches that Abraham Lincoln gave. He was the 16th president. And uh, as he became the candidate for president, he ran uh, on the platform of the problem of slavery which Vera was mounting to be a very divisive problem in here in the United States, as the southern states, which included Georgia. The landowners had thousands of slaves, and the northern states wanted it to stop, the slave labor. And so it was much turmoil, and he ran saying that he would solve that problem. And so they elected him. Very unusual, he almost didn't get elected and his physical attributes were kind of strange. Tall, skinny, with a beard, top hat. But people liked what he said that he would do. And he began his agenda to change that circumstance. And shortly after he began his first term, like it was the custom then, he gave the speech of inauguration. But it's not written on those stones. Soon after he became president, The southern states that had the slaves decided they were going to separate from the United States of America. Became a crisis. And this brought forth the declaration of war against those states by the Union. And the southern states got together and called themselves Confederates. And this was a central cause, the status of slavery. And just before the war started, there were four million enslaved black people. 
They were called property, not people. Property. Four million. Almost all of them in the south. And our state of Georgia and six other slave states, southern, declared secession from the country and formed the Confederacy. Two years of terrible war, as those wars were carnage, death, the bodies began to pile up. And two years into the war, November 19, 1863, in the midst of the death and suffering, President Lincoln dedicated the National Cemetery, which is also a place to visit in Washington. And there he inaugurated it and made a speech which became famous known as the Gettysburg Address, a message of hope in the midst of war and death and destruction. And his determination to see a victorious conclusion of that American Civil War. And in that speech, he said he not only wanted to be victorious over the southern states, but he wanted them to reunite them, stretch the hand of brotherhood and unite them so that we might be as the founding fathers wanted us to be, a nation that was created equal, everyone equal, under the law and the practice. Then, one year later, the third year of the war, November 15th of 1864, a general named Sherman marched into our city, Atlanta, and burned it almost all to the ground. Yes, we were the rebels. We were the slave owners. We were the evil ones. And there, as he spoke that famous Gettysburg Address, as they buried the soldiers, it became so famous that it is etched in the wall of the memorial in Washington, the Lincoln Memorial, the whole speech. So then, after the burning of Atlanta, one year later, again, they voted Abraham Lincoln to be president and have a second term of his presidency. So the 4th of March, 1865, Abraham Lincoln was again voted for the second time, and he made the second inaugural address. And this address, which I will take just a little part of what he said as part of my message. This second inaugural address is graven word by word on the north wall of the Lincoln Memorial. In his speech, he quoted a verse from the Bible which showed how important since childhood the Bible was for Abraham Lincoln. And the verse was Psalm 19 and verse 9. Now quote, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
And after he quoted this verse, which as he said, it was 3,000 years old, he added, fondly do we hope, fervently, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass by. Yes. But if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled up by 250 years of toil be sunk, be lost. And until every drop of blood that was drawn by the lash might be paid by another drop drawn by the sword. And as the psalm says, so still it must be said. He said, let the war go on until all that they profited, they lose it. They're left with nothing that was made unjustly. That was stolen from the strength of the slaves. And every drop of love, blood, because they lashed them often to make them work harder. That every drop that they brought out of the backs of the slaves may be equal to another drop of blood that our sword caused in them what a speech an inaugural he said I'm willing to continue this war as long as it takes but this must be done so he saw he saw that this was the judgment of God. That's why he quoted this verse. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous. Saying the Lord will judge. And if it takes forever. It will happen. So he was saying that the Lord's judgment would be the loss. Of wealth. And the loss. Of life. In the past two years in this world, we are seeing a great loss of wealth. Wealth that has been accumulated, taken from the people, taken from the hours of slave labor of the poor. Of the working class. There are riches in the world. They, there's made a, a whole system. We are also seeing a judgment on all that wealth. We are seeing the loss of uncountable riches. Corporations failing, businesses failing. And then we've been seeing the loss of life. We also are seeing that affliction. Not only here, but all over the world. There's a psalm that Abraham Lincoln quoted The fear of the Lord is clean. The word fear here in the Hebrew means here, fear, terror, panic. It's fear. And clean means 
to make pure. The opposite of what was filthy and soiled. Which means that that suffering, that fear, that terror, that panic will take away the filth of the heart. Yes, many times we see even in the scriptures that suffering is one of the cleansing agents of heaven. He cleanses the earth with suffering. He cleansed the sins of the world by his sufferings on the cross. Yes, suffering is an agent of making clean that which is filthy and soiled. The judgments of the Lord are true, are righteous altogether, which means his judgments makes everything good again. Makes everything better. It cleanses the filth that was accumulated. It fixes. The evil. The suffering of the people. Of the governments. Of the world. Bring forth. A judgment of the Lord. That takes care of the sins of the past and starts something new. The world has seen such sufferings of war and blood in the past and injustices. We have seen this before. How God reset the world, even geopolitically, taking away nations and putting others. It started something new in the world. And then we've seen that new what he did, which started afresh with everyone happy that the war was over. They could go to work in peace, make money and spend it and buy the refrigerator, the automobile. The war was over. Everyone was happy. It was like all that that has happened was cleaned. And joy was again in the earth. God has seen from heaven the evil. and says he will make things right. He will judge. God's justice will prevail. And he will make right the wrongs. Yes, there is a process. There's something that we must go through. It wasn't just the armies of the south and of the north. Everyone suffered. In a war, everybody suffers. Those involved and those not involved. It affects everybody. Emotionally, financially, psychologically. Affected every family. So yes, it is pain. It is suffering. It is loss, but it makes things clean again. And when we look back at the many times that God has cleaned this world, so terrible, like I said, was the Second World War, and yet a new world was born of equity, prosperity, justice. And again now we see the terrible deterioration, the evil everywhere, the dirt, the filth, in the streets, in the homes, in the schools, in the government, in morality, the rising of evil that we look around and say, how can it be? Quickly it's looks like it's worse and worse and deteriorating but God's watchful eye is always upon the world and upon our lives he created he put everyone in place that had to be in place and he will do his work his judgments his eye 
is upon our lives. And especially upon the lives of his children. And how evil has affected them. I remember. It wasn't that long ago. When only one man, the husband, had to go out and work, maybe in a factory. And with the wages he brought home, it was enough for his household, his wife, his children, enough to buy a home, enough to buy some transportation. It was enough. It was never heard of that you needed two or three salaries. But now, in most of the world, the world I've visited, yes, there need to be two slaves working, toiling. Yes, God sees, he looks. He looks at the place of a mother is being robbed to the children. He sees because it's his world. It's his children. He sees what is done and what is being done. He sees how the children are being stolen. He sees. And there comes a time where he says, I will not let this go on further. And he steps in. In Psalm 30, in verse 5, it says, For his anger endures but for a moment. And in his favor is life. For weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Joy comes after suffering joy comes after war joy comes after pandemics joy comes after judgment yes after the fire the wildfire has burned the forest through the ashes the green begins to grow The new trees begin to grow among the destroyed forest. Yes, life springs up from the ashes. And as Lincoln said, yes, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondsman's 250 years of unrewarded or unrequited Unrewarded work, all their wealth will be sunk. Yes, shall be sunk. In other words, all that the money that the people have made on the back of suffering, they will lose. So do not be surprised. If there comes a reset or a collapsing of economy, The rich is taken away. Don't be surprised as God judges and cleans this world until every drop of blood drawn by the lash inflicted upon his people shall be paid. As Lincoln said, yes, he will judge and he will renew. Many ask themselves, have asked me, John, how long will this last? And some say, oh, oh, I think we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. I hope it's not a train. I think it's getting better now. It might be over. They say, how much more? It's been two years already. You know, as Lincoln said on that speech on March 4th, If God wills, may it continue until the wealth is lost and suffering inflicted is paid in full. You know, Abraham did not get to live to see the end of the war. Even though he said, 
May it go on as long as necessary until the judgment of God is consumed. He didn't see the fulfillment of his quest to unite America. He didn't see the reward for judgment because 41 days later of that speech of inauguration, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and he died 14th of April of 1865. But his death was not in vain. Because six days after his death that shook the nation and is remembered till this day, the leader of the armies of the South, the Confederate General Robert E. Lee, surrendered all his army six days later. At the Appomattox Courthouse, effectively ending the American Civil War. But even though the war ends, the judgment ceases, and the fire of the forest is quenched, things don't go back to normal in an instant. The new begins to slowly grow out of the burnt soil and ashes. But the new is born. Like the rebirth of the phoenix bird out of the fire of destruction and death. And here we are today in the beautiful city of Atlanta. And you would never know that Atlanta was just a heap of ashes. A rebel city that lost. But you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know the history. You wouldn't know what it's going through. It's flourishing. Ever since I saw Atlanta when I came many years ago and my father moved here, And I saw what Atlanta was. And and in these few decades, it's incredible how God has blessed this city. Made it a name in the world. The greatest, more active airport. Say, wow, you'd never know the blessings that God bestowed after his judgments. He destroyed And he built. Like he says, his hand wounds and with his hand he heals. Yes. It won't happen in a moment. No, God's new plan for the world will slowly come forth out of the ashes of the past of his judgments. But don't fear. Rejoice because God is in control just as he always has had, has been Not only of the world, but of every individual life. And his plans will be fulfilled. And when it's his time, he will give the order. But yes, we should be happy that God is not letting the filth overcome the world. That he intervened with judgment. Thank God that he took control, took the reins of this world, and literally stopped the world in their tracks. In just a few days, in a few weeks, everything stopped, came to a halt, everything. Yes, God took control. And what will happen? When judgment is appeased, mercy will give an order. And the order we find in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 3. He will order 
or appoint to them that have been mourning in Zion. For them to be given beauty in place of their ashes. Beauty. Beautiful flowers growing out of what was the ashes of that place, of that life, of that business, of that family, of those children. And the oil of joy to replace their mourning and sadness. And a garment, a covering of praise for that spirit of heaviness that they have born, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So those that were mourning in Zion, they might be given joy and a garment of praise. And they will build the old wastes. Oh, I like this. He will build up that which was taken out, that which was made waste. The stones that were thrown away. The foundations that were discarded. It says. He. Will allow them to build. Will order them to build. The waste places. And will rise up. The former desolations. Yes we see it can never. Return to be. I'm sure the people mourned over Atlanta. Atlanta as the smoke was still rising and they were looted from everything. Who could have hoped that one day Atlanta would be so blessed among the cities of the world? Yes. Who could have thought that those desolations could have been rebuilt? And he shall repair not only the waste cities. There's so many cities that are gone to waste. The violence. The evil. The killings. They've gone to waste cities. He says he will repair them. Yes Chicago. He will repair you. Yes California. He will repair you. Yes. He will repair you. Yes, family that's desolated, he will repair you. He will repair the desolations of many generations. Not only for our generation, but for many generations. You ask me how he's going to do it, I don't know. But God will do something new. And as World War II with the desolation, destruction of Japan, that there was left nothing economically. Cities destroyed, everything. And look at it now. Look at it now. A few years, decades after the war, they began sending us their wonderful autos. And we began sending them money for our autos. And we built them up. And Japan is so prosperous among the nations. Yes, who would have thought that our enemy would become my ally and the destruction would become something lovely. The desolation of many generations. I know I probably won't see it, not from this side at least. But oh, just to think, as I look back, one generation, two generations, what it was like before, I say, wow, to think that, that he's going to restore that. Wow. His mercy after judgment is wonderful. And then verse 7 says, in Isaiah 61, for your shame, 
you shall have double. For your confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess twice or the double, and everlasting joy shall be to them. In verse 8, for I, the Lord, love judgment. We don't, we don't like judgment. But God says, I love judgment. I hate robbery for a burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth. I will direct their work. He will make sure. No, no, no. It's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be this way, the future that I have. I will direct their work in truth. And then I will make an everlasting covenant with them. So I end with Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise the Lord and all oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Do you dare to believe? Could you say with me today, even though your life, your home, your business, your land, your city might be in dire shape, but can you believe that his mercy endures and that the Lord is good? Can you believe that? I know it's not easy. Because as you see the desolation, the dearth, the destruction, the tearing down of those things that are built in evil, it might affect you, might be personally or maybe your business, but know that the Lord is good and he will rebuild from the ashes a new world. And we know as we read the prophecies of Ezekiel and the visions of Daniel and the visions of John, the beloved. We know that there also will come a time that will be so much worse than this. Because it, it seems to be in cycles. The world seems to go to evil, then God intervenes. Things happen. He resets the world. It starts to be built again in another way. Then evil begins growing like an evil root. Infiltrating with evil and morality, everything. Then God steps in and renews for another time, for another generation. But we know the time will come. When evil will be much worse. But you know what? We know the end of the book. He will come and intervene. And he's going to wipe this old earth off and make a new one. But not before coming here with his angels and saying, hey, you guys, I'm taking over the government of the world for 1,000 years. Oh, wonderful it would be to live in that time. God-loving people as presidents, as governors, school boards. Wow. His loved children that love mercy. And he with his angels controlling for a thousand years. And meanwhile, where's evil? Well, I guess he's supposed to be, he's going to be in change. You read about that? But he says, because he knows his time is short. He's very angry. And I think he's very angry now. He doesn't like God intervention. He doesn't like people scared and panicked. But we know that God is in control 
For God is good, and His mercy towards us, towards His people, and towards the world He's created, His mercy endures forever. And his mercy endureth forever. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. And his mercy endureth forever. Yes, Father, I believe in your word. I believe that you are a good God. That you love judgment because you love mercy. And in order to be able to give mercy, you must judge evil. Lord, I trust in you. I trust in you. And I'm so happy to know that the world is in control, isn't in control, that you're in control, and everything that happens and will happen. They'll be forced to do what you have planned for this next generation. Yes, thank you that your mercy is still active on her and your mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Amen.